Hey guys, tonight we're going to be talking about upper respiratory disorders. So what are upper respiratory disorders? They're ones that include the nose and throat, and then also the upper airway passages, um, you know, the everything that kind of the tubes that lead to more tubes that lead to the lungs. Um, so there's three disorders we're going to talk about. The first one is going to be allergic rhinitis. So, you know, what allergic rhinitis is, is actually a part of hypersensitivity disorders. And it's where your body overreacts when there's an allergen exposed to, um, that you're exposed to. So for example, like some common ones might be pollen, dust mites, or animal fur. Um, and so, you know, pretty much what happens is that, you know, these are harmless chemicals or things in your body. But once your body senses them, your body says, oh, no, 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 this is not good. And it starts to build a defense up against them. Then every time that, um, you know, that, that thing, whatever that allergen might be comes back, um, you know, that defense comes up again and your body starts fighting. You know, how that manifests is, is that people are going to complain of, you know, it, everything's itchy and watery. And so in other words, they have a runny nose and it's important to note that they have clear drainage with that runny nose. Um, you know, it's not going to be thick or it's usually like thin and watery and it's just pure drainage. It's not um, like infectious, like yellow and thick and yucky. It's thin, clear drainage from the nose. Um, they also can have itchy eyes and itchy throat. They may have like a mild cough, stuff like that as well. Um, but as a whole, what's happening here is that the body is overreacting to a stimulus, um, <clears throat> whatever this allergen is that is uh, the person is exposed to. And it starts kind of building up this defense. And, um, you know, uh, the, the result of that is a lot of uncomfortable symptoms. So what do we do to treat this? So something that's important to note is, is that there's medications we can give to prevent people from reacting so much. There's also medications we can give to treat people, um, you know, that are having these active symptoms. So, you know, a lot of allergic rhinitis you can see is prevention. In other words, if I take medications on a regular basis, and that includes the corticosteroids, the leukotriene receptor antagonist, mast cell stabilizers, um, even antihistamines can also be used as preventative. Um, if I take those on like around uh, a, a regular basis, then I can actually stop myself from reacting so much. In other words, you know, that, that system that's setting in motion that's saying, oh my gosh, there's an intruder. This, these medications help to stop that process or slow it down. It stops the body from reacting so much. And if my body's not reacting, I'm not going to have those uncomfortable symptoms. My body can take it easy and relax a little bit. Um, so the steroids, the leukotriene receptor antagonists and mast cell stabilizers, they all help to prevent that. And they need to be taken regularly, like the mast cell stabilizers and corticosteroids. Um, you know, they usually we um, take those on a regular basis. And like the mast cell stabilizer, we a lot of times take that right before, um, you know, uh, you know, allergy season, pollen season comes out, whatever you're allergic to, it can be really helpful. The leukotriene receptor antagonists are oral medications that you can take, um, whereas the other two, the steroids and the mast cell stabilizers are a nasal spray. Um, you can learn more about those medications if you watch my medication PowerPoint that's also on my YouTube channel. So like I mentioned, antihistamines can be used to prevent, but they also can be used to actively treat. And it's really important to know what this medication is doing um, in the sense of like, it, do I need to give it during an acute attack? Oh, uh oh, lost my thing. Do I need to give it during an acute attack, or um, is it going to, um, you know, be used just to prevent me from having symptoms? And for antihistamines, they can do both. So if I was going to go and see a friend and they had a dog, um, and I'm allergic to dogs, I could take antihistamines before to prevent myself from having an attack, or after I got there, if I started reacting, I could take an antihistamine then and then stop reacting. Um, so they can definitely help with both. And you know, really when it comes to allergic rhinitis, prevention is key. Cause like it says over here, my role mainly in allergic rhinitis is education. Teaching them to take their medications prior to exposure is gonna be a big thing. And on top of that, so if I'm allergic to dogs, like it's gonna be hard. I'm not luckily, but you know, let's say that I was, um, but um, you know, that, that that's really hard. But if I'm gonna sit there and get a dog and just live with the allergies, that's gonna make life pretty hard. So I'm gonna probably have to avoid those triggers. And I always um, laugh. I have a friend that, um, uh, what do you call it, had tons of allergies to animal fur. And then she went into like neuroscience research. And so like all of her research is with, um, you know, like rats and stuff like that. And she's like badly allergic to them. Not like 
throat closing allergic, but very allergic to these, um, this fur, but she loves her job so much. So she just kept like, she takes medicine nonstop and stuff like that in order to continue doing the job that she loves, but that's not recommended. What we recommend is to avoid your triggers. So if your job or your workplace or your home place, something there is triggering you kind of modifying that environment or modifying that role in order to um, prevent these attacks. Additionally, you can look in your book to see a comprehensive list, but making general environmental changes. So, you know, if I was allergic to mold or something like that, then making sure that I'm doing things in my house to prevent mold from forming. So keeping it clean and dry. Um, what do you call it? Uh, making sure that I'm um, changing out my air filter regularly, um, making sure to keep the humidity at a safe level, um, you know, keeping in like a lot of times keeping animals and other, um, you know, things like that out of the bedroom where I spend a lot of my time time sleeping can be helpful. So there's a lot of different ways that um, uh, what do you call it? Um, it, we can change our environment. So I would check into your book to kind of see the ways that we can change our house to make it uh, where we can actually um, have less chance of attacks as well. So we talked about allergic rhinitis, which is an overreaction of the body to some sort of, um, you know, stimulus or pollen, you know, fur, skin, uh, what you call it, um, mold, et cetera. So now let's talk about acute sinusitis. So, you know, a lot of times people get these mixed up. So sinusitis is different, that it has nothing to do necessarily with allergens. It's actually usually related to infection. It can be related to a virus or bacteria or fungus, um, but it's a swelling or an inflammation of the sinuses as a result of that infection. Um, and the patient's gonna complain of being congested. Ha they're gonna have like that yellow thick drainage that I was talking about. Um, um, sinus pain, and remember sinus pain is kind of around here, like over your nasal bridge and up, uh, we caught over, uh, we caught uh, around your eyes as well. Um, and that sinus pain can be pretty intense and they may also have a fever since there's an infectious process going on. So this looks different than um, allergic rhinitis because it's not necessarily the result of like an allergic stimulus. Like, you know, I ran into something that I'm allergic to and now I'm reacting. Um, and um, the congestion symptom is um, a really, really characteristic and telltale of acute sinusitis. And then that thick yellow drainage. So it's like this, that's, it's all these signs of infection and inflammation versus allergic rhinitis, which is more just kind of that watery, clear, itchy um, uh, symptoms. So how do we treat this? So the main thing is we want to help to get the um, that congestion is usually the biggest symptom they complain about. So we give them decongestants. But again, check out my medication PowerPoint. There's some good stuff to know about this medication, like the fact that um, we do, do not want people to take this medication for too long because they actually can make their congestion worse. Remember with allergic rhinitis, we want to take those medications on a regular basis, whereas with decongestants, it's the opposite. We want to take them for a fixed amount of time, fixed dose, so that we don't take too much and then end up making the problem worse. Um, also for the pain and the inflammation, giving NSAIDs or acetaminophen, and that acetaminophen can also help to decrease the fever that the patient may be having. Um, they may require antibiotics, but we usually try to hold off. Like if after a week they're not getting better, then we will maybe add antibiotics. But as a whole, if we can avoid antibiotics, we try to. Um, we only want to give them to patients who absolutely need them. But um, for some patients, their sinusitis doesn't get better. So we need to add those on. My main role as the nurse is to provide comfort and just to be looking for complications, making sure like, you know, a patient could start with a viral acute sinusitis. And then because that congestion and stuff like that, they can end up getting a secondary bacterial infection. In other words, they start with a virus, but then bacteria grows while the virus is healing. So, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that can happen. So I should be looking out for that as the nurse. Then also providing comfort. So hot packs to the face, it can be very comforting, doing nasal rinches rinses or lavages. Um, keeping the head a bit elevated is key because kind of think of it like if I broke my arm and it was really swollen, if I elevated it, that swelling goes down. Same with my head. If my, if my nose and my face and everything on my sinuses are inflamed, if I lay down, that's not going to help to decrease that inflammation. So it helps to sleep with the head a bit elevated um, and keep that up to decrease that swelling. Um, and then hot showers and steam can help to loosen up some of those secretions. 
Last but not least, there's influenza. And what that is, is a virus. And this is a virus that changes every year. So most people know the flu vaccine is something you get a new one every year and you get a new one because this is a virus that is so smart and has replicated and it changes a little different every year. Um, but it's a very contagious upper respiratory infection. And most people get this confused because they think influenza is like a lung problem, but it's actually an upper airway problem. And the patient has a sore throat, cough, they can have a fever, body aches, fatigue, malaise. They can have some GI symptoms and stuff as well. Um, but as a whole, um, you know, the thing with viruses that's good to know is that these are very self-limiting. In other words, um, there's not a lot I can do to treat them except for supportive care. And we're going to kind of get into that. So, you know, the best thing we can do with influenza is try to prevent it. Um, we can prevent it or improve outcomes with a yearly vaccine. And something that's really important to know, it's something I didn't understand before I came to nursing school is that, you know, I don't get a yearly flu vaccine just for me. And I don't get a yearly flu vaccine to prevent me from getting the flu, but I do get it to prevent it, uh, me from dying from the flu. In other words, if I get a vaccine, um, to help me with the flu. Its job is, is not, it can't always stop me from getting the flu because there's a lot of different strains. And even if I have that protection, sometimes the flu is super strong some years. Um, but what it's gonna stop me is from having complications or a really bad outcome from it. So it's really important patients understand that because there's a lot of misconceptions around different vaccines and things like that. And regardless of what you believe, and I'm not gonna get too big into belief systems and stuff like that about vaccines, but it's just important as a healthcare provider to always provide an unbiased opinion of just what are the facts about, you know, why we give vaccines and stuff like that and how we can really um, help that person because it can be kind of hard in medicine sometime, but um, it's really important that people can make an opinion and judgment for themselves what's best for their health based on the best information that you can give them. Um, so high risk groups should always be vaccinated and that includes like healthcare workers, first responders and stuff like that as well. People that are going to be exposed to a lot of um, people that may be sick. Also people that live in kind of communal places like nursing homes and stuff like that would be higher risk as well. Um, you know, actual treatment, like I mentioned, was just supportive, like, you know, managing symptoms. So like acetaminophen for the fever, maybe to help with the body aches and stuff like that too, maybe um, to help with a sore throat uh, and maybe just some other medications just to help them like with some of those uncomfortable symptoms that they're having. Um, rest is key. So letting the, like the best way to treat a virus is to rest and um, make sure you're staying hydrated. Um, if it's caught early, we can give a medication. It's an antiviral called alseltamivir. Um, and this is not going to stop or kill the flu, but it's going to decrease your length of your illness or decrease, it may decrease some of your symptoms. And it's going to um, usually help if it's if it's given early in the influenza, it can actually help so you don't have influenza as long as you would have. Um, overall, my role as the nurse is education, identifying the high risk group, and then monitoring for complications. So like I mentioned, influenza is an upper airway and respiratory problem. So if I'm starting to have lung problems, like I'm having wet lung sounds, um, I'm showing signs like my I had a fever, it went away, and then it came back. Um, you know, I'm uh, really um, starting to cough up some really yucky, purulent stuff from my lungs, stuff like that. I would be start to be concerned about this patient. Um, because this patient, um, again, their symptoms are most are, should be upper airway. If there's starting to be lung involvement, that means that maybe I'm getting into a pneumonia or some complication of influenza. So it's always good to be kind of aware and do regular lung assessments to make sure the patient's not having a spread to that infection. So that's pretty much it when it comes to um, upper respiratory disorders. I hope this was helpful. I'll see you next time.